a bingo in there. Um, so I'm not. I'm probably not being as powerful as Ben because I wasn't as wise as he was. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk about um, zooarchaeology and theory. Apologies to Terry and to anyone else who likes cats or puppies. Um, some of you therefore know what might be coming for some of this. Um, but actually, I'm going to start about the pub. So, so in some parts, part of this talk is inspired by um, being in the pub, uh, just as Liz was talking about. And at one point after a research seminar, a colleague turned to me, um, I won't say who, and said, uh, they were a little bit drunk, and said, so where do you think the next paradigm shift in archaeology is going to come from? And being young and cocky, I said, that's so last century. <laughs> you know, they won't be one. And so to put that into kind of slight context, this is um, Schiffer's <laughs> Archaeology, Method and Theory, uh, 1985. Um, Hodder produced an article called um, Post-Possessional Archaeology. It was the first time post-possessional archaeology was used in the title, 1985. I was six <laughs> at that point. Try teaching that to undergraduates that were born in 1997. <laughs> It is, it is not relevant today, it's not relevant to my generation of archaeologists, it's not relevant to our generation of zoo archaeologists or environmental archaeologists anymore. Those arguments are gone. You know, we, we, have, we have gone beyond this silly dichotomy of kind of people arguing about possessionism and post-possessionism. In reality, there probably was no, no big change. What happened is people just discovered some new French philosophers that we could kind of use. Looking at Ben and assemblage theory. <laughs> So that one of the reasons was, of course, my age, being young and cocky, I could say that. And the other one was actually my work. So I, I, m most of you know me for looking at animal burials. And this involves um, looking not just at the zooarchaeological data, but actually I've had to engage in a lot of archaeological theory to look at animal burials. And one of the aspects I've argued about is that actually we shouldn't look at this kind of, we as zooarchaeologists and moral archaeologists, we are obsessed by that kind of depositional part of the story of our remains and actually we should be thinking about all the stuff that happened beforehand all the above ground actions that occur and the social meanings and the human agency or the natural processes and all these transformations that's what we should kind of be thinking about and of course in arguing this as a zoo archaeologist I have had to engage with I'll get rid of your buzzword bingo cards actor network theory biographical approaches chain repertoire all these aspects of archaeological theory come into my work and I'm quite comfortable using them and talking about them. Um, to to, to, uh, to emphasise that point about why we should look at above ground remains, I'm going to show a short video, if it works. Go on. So there's no, ah, oh, there's no sound, oh no. Okay, so this is a video from BBC Around the World in 80 Religions. It was basically a video of, oh, some of you might, if you're a bit delicate, you might want to look away at some points. Um, <laughs> so, it's a little bit jittery, sorry about that, that's why I wanted to try and put the laptop in. But basically it's, a, it's a, um, a parish priest went around looking at different religions. This is a voodoo ceremony for the Church of Fron in Africa. And they sacrifice a number of animals in this ceremony. It's actually mixtures of voodooism and, sorry it's so blocky, um, and um, taking on aspects of Catholic, faith, of Catholic mass as well and all sorts of things are mixed in there. What's interesting um, with the animals is, yeah, that's the bit where the puppy and kitten are. Um, <laughs> so what's interesting with the animals is, is they're sacrificing them. They whisper a message into their ear before they, before they kill them. And it's actually the whispering of the message into the ear that is the important part of this ceremony. And that's the message that they can then carry on up to the gods and they, and they spread their blood on these stones. Um, the cow and the goat, etc., are just then consumed in a big massive feast. And the final part, which people, which, which unfortunately didn't show very well, is the, I'll skip that bit. The final part that didn't show very well is that the puppy and kitten end up in a ditch. And actually, and if they ended up in a ditch and were covered over, you would get an animal burial. And of course, as archeologists, we would go along and say, oh, look, it's a ritual deposit. But actually it's not, because actually the ritual occurred above ground. So actually, so what I've argued is we should care about what's happening above ground and go for the bits that happen above ground. It's difficult to do, um, but it's something we should be striving towards. So that's kind of what I've argued in my research. If anyone wants to see the video, you're particularly gruesome, um, and I'll happily show it to them in the break, um, in a non-blocky kind of fashion. So, so that's kind of where my research has been going. And then more recently, 
I've been engaging in the archaeology of emotion, um, all immensely fluffy kind of stuff, but very, very interesting. And so using the work of Sarah Tallow and Ollie Harris and Howard Williams and other such people, more and more archaeologists are looking at aspects of emotion. The reason for this is actually these above ground events are very emotive. There's an awful lot of different emotion that's occurring within, within them. And so you could break the archaeology of emotion up into kind of two things, really. One big scale emotion. So Leicester City being top of the league, that for me is a big scale emotion. Um, or you can have the more personal small scale emotions as well. So such as Howard Williams has talked about um, the body and material culture helping, help, um, helping to mediate kind of these emotions through the actions that take place in cremations and other such things. So the reason I've been interested in the archaeology of emotion is because I've set a challenge, really. Um, so there's a book coming out called Morning Animals, and I've set a challenge to say, is there any evidence of, uh, that you can find in the zoo archaeological record of grieving for animals in the past? And initially, you know, with my zoo arch hat on, um, camped in processionalism, I went, no, don't be silly. Um, and then actually, of course, I started to think about it. So one of the ways I start to think about this is actually my own cats. So, so this is Henry and up there is Pepsi. And unfortunately they died quite recently. Um, we buried them um, in my mother-in-law's garden um, to get them there because we live in Preston and my mother-in-law lives in Kent. So we had to use um, Oxford Archaeology East sample buckets. Thank you, Oxford Archaeology East. Um, they're not getting them back. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, and it may have been a while, actually. There were no sample buckets for quite a while before we actually managed to get them to the garden to be buried. And this was a very, very emotive event. And I started thinking about actually the burial of my family, cat, of my, of my family cats. Um, actually, around that tree, there are four cats. <coughs> That's why we have to take them to Kent. It's the family burial ground for cats um, in the Morris Biddle family household. And this Tango, who's, who was the first one, uh, who's, who was a zoo archaeologist, if we were to excavate the site <clears throat> in 200 years' time and we had excellent bone preservation, this is what we may end up finding. So we'd find some very square cut holes because, because of course, me and my wife are archaeologists, so we've just, you know, we've got two proper sided test pits for our, for our burials. Um, and we'd find you know, male cats, another male cat, a weird double burial of one male cat and a female cat in a plastic container because she'd been in there for a bit of a while and I didn't want my five-year-old son to see what was in there. Um, so, so but, the re but the way to start thinking about this is, is actually, are there any examples of this kind of action in the archaeological record? And there are. Um, so this is from Silchester. This is Silchester kissed burial in a midden. So, so we've, what we have is a, a midden near the northern gate of Silchester, seven minutes. Um, and someone has gone in there and built this tile kist and placed, placed a cat in there. And actually that reminds me very much of Pepsi in the nice sample bucket buried in the ground there. There's other examples as well. So thank you to Faye Worley who, who reminded me of the Stanwyck dog, um, which is very, another tile kist burial with a very, very small dog. Faye thinks it might be the smallest dog in Britain. And so we have other examples as well, not, uh, not necessarily tile kiss, but at York Road in Leicester, there's a late Roman cemetery. And one of the graves that is cut basically for, for human size has no human, well, has a small fragments of human bone in there that they don't think were placed in there, um, they think they're redeposited. And but it does have a nice dog splayed out there as well. And of course, it's very easy to look at these deposits when we're looking at actually Roman material, because we know that they were keeping pets in the Roman period. Um, in Greece, we've got dedications and gravestones to actual man's best friend and to pets as well. But one of the ways we can start to use this to think about this archaeology of emotion and whether zoo archaeologists can, can look at archaeology of emotion is to actually think about putting people back in. So this is the Oakington cow, it's got, uh, and the reason I'm showing the slide is actually there's the stu you come students around the cow and the human burial, and actually it's very rare that you start to think about people and when you look at these deposits, and actually how would people have been positioned when they're placing the burial in the ground, how, would, how many people actually do you need to place these burials in the ground? Um, that then brings me back to my cats, because I was the one that placed our cats in the sample book, it was very, 
quite emotional, um, intimate moments of actually having to position my poor dead cats into the sample bucket, and then again positioning them in the ground as well. And, this, and that was actually the point of emotion was really that point of contact there. Five minutes, wow. So this is the, that way it started me thinking about other time periods as well. And actually, I mainly work in the Iron Age, although like all Iron Age specialists, we're drawn into the Roman period too often. Um, so, and here we have a nice beehive pit from, from Winnell Down, and we have a dog burial placed within the side of the pit. Um, this is pit 6595. The reason I use it, it was, it was the, basically the last example in J.D. Hill's BAR, and it's the last example discussed in my BAR as well. So, but I started to think actually, but we need to put people back into this picture. So actually for this dog burial, the little dotted lines are basically um, the circumference of me if I was squatting down trying to position that dog bear in there. So it only fitted two people in. And the dog is nicely positioned against the side of the, the, side of the pit. It's actually, it's a beehive pit, so you can see that it's just under the, uh, the overhang of, of the pit as well. So you would have had that a very intimate moment where two people would have had to position that kind of animal in there as well. So perhaps by thinking this way, we can start to kind of maybe think about the emotions that would have taken place. Um, I've discussed this actually with Richard Madgwick, who's at Cardiff and not here, and he loves pigs, and he argued that actually the dog is there for the pig. And that actually, if you're looking at the pig is in the center of the pit, and, what, and if you think about putting people in, then you would have people all the way around the pit looking at the pig itself. Both arguments are just as valid, but the important point is actually we need to start putting people back into our archaeological record. And as zoo, ar as zoo archaeologists, we need to start thinking about this as well. So I would argue, I've argued that we should be looking at these above ground actions, but also I think we need to start looking, or I'm going to start looking for these moments of intimacy, these moments when actually humans and dead animals um, would have been, or humans would have been manipulating animals as well, and actually the contact that would have taken place there. Can you have a zoo archaeology of emotion? Possibly. You know, I would argue actually for looking at these moments of intimacy, yes. But in terms of this session, what's more important is that actually we try. And I would argue that I would call myself a social zoo archaeologist. And re actually, in reality, we could cross all that out, and I'm just an archaeologist in reality. And actually, social zoo archaeology, I would argue, is about trying to put people back into the picture. And actually thinking about these above ground events, and about thinking about what people are actually doing. Because at the end of the day, that's actually what we're probably more interested in. So to go back to the pub conversation, um, that I had with my colleague at the beginning, I then would, would go on and say, actually, I've just reached a stage where we're comfortable. We're comfortable playing with different ideas and methods. Basically, I'm a zoo archaeologist that's comfortable with theory. And we should all be comfortable with theory, because Susie asked me to quote from the book, and I found a quote last night when, she, when I left the pub, she slurred at me. You must <laughs> quote from the book. So I found a quote from the book from Graham Barker's piece. So environmental, the environmental archaeologists also need to be mainstream archaeologists if they are to make them at their material count as it should, which means for many being more theoretically informed and bolder. And I would completely agree. And if you would turn your attention to the program and actually look at 11.30, you'll notice that three out of the five speakers at 11.30 are environmental archaeologists, and two of them are not in this session. And that is being in, in, that is being theoretically informed and bold. The end. <laughs> <laughs>